Of the nibbles and pods, and thus swiftly attain the state of Vajadhara. Okay, let's just do the four, the four limitless contemplations. Now, these are really, really good if you're not doing very much practice. Of course, if you're doing them as well, but these bring up all the compassion all this is the these are really the truth the four limitless contemplation so even if you're starting a practice these are very this is a very good prayer to say may may all beings have happiness and create the causes of happiness may they all be free from suffering and creating the causes of suffering May they find that noble happiness, which can never be tainted by, by suffering. May they attain universal, impartial compassion, free of worldly bias towards friends and enemies. Nearing Chaktang Mitang Trawe, Tang Dong Chempo Lane Pa Juchik. Okay, so what I'm doing, there are quite a lot of people that are unfortunately away, but they can get the recording. But what I'm doing is is um is part three of this series. And the idea of doing this series was even for those that are more advanced on the path. It's really good to go back and see, check out all the things. And I'm trying to put in little things for you as well that maybe you haven't thought about before. But I want to do three or four sessions like that then when people call me or call the center or call you, you can send them the four sessions. It's easy to get it on YouTube. And then we can go on to other subjects. But I think that... Until you can discuss, until you can really understand these subjects, you can't really go on your journey. So tonight I called the bondage, the bondage of karmic habits versus the freedom of the awakened mind. And that's up to you to choose. It really, really is. So I've got to go back on this story because it really explains everything beautifully. And I want to read you the story, even if you've heard it before. For the last 10 years of his life, Tim's father had Alzheimer's disease. Despite the devoted care of Tim's mother, he'd slowly deteriorated until he had become a, a sort of a walking vegetable. He was unable to speak, and was fed, clothed, and cared for as if he were a very young child. As Tim and his brother grew older, they would stay with their father for brief periods of time while their mother took care of the needs of the household. One Sunday, while she was out doing the shopping, the boys, then 15 and 17, watched football as their father sat nearby in a chair. Shame, he keeps get bumpy, getting bumped all over. There you are. Good to see you. Okay. Their father, sorry, their father, suddenly, their father sat nearby in a chair. Suddenly, he slumped forward and fell to the floor. Both sons realized immediately that something was terribly wrong. His color was gray and his breath uneven and rasping. Frightened, Tim's older brother told him to call 911. Before he could respond, a voice that he had not heard in 10 years, a voice he could barely remember, interrupted. Don't call 911, son. Tell your mother that I love her. Tell her that I am all right. And Tim's father died. Now, Tim then became a cardiologist, interestingly enough. And when he was telling the story, Tim, a cardiologist, Looked around the group, looked around the room. So let me do in. Looked around the room at the group of doctors that were mesmerized by this movie. Because he died unexpectedly, um, 
the law at home, the law required that we have an autopsy. He told us quietly, my father's brain was almost entirely destroyed by this disease. He said, for many years, I've asked myself now as a cardiologist, who spoke? Because he hadn't spoke, spoken for 10 years. I have never found even the slightest help from any medical textbook. I'm no closer to knowing this now than I was then. But carrying this question with me reminds me of something important, something I do not want to forget. Okay? Much of life can be explained, can never be explained, but only witnessed. Now, this story of Tim's father having, having Alzheimer's and then speaking is such a brilliant story to, to Halakath to, to really teach you what it really means that that nature of mind is totally unaffected by any disease, any negative emotions, any karma you're going through, any anything. And that is why it is so vital that you find that connection to the nature of mind so that everything can go through you, from the nature of mind, through you. It's really, really important that you understand this because that nature of mind can function totally without a brain. So that people, for example, like people who are handicapped mentally, it's quite amazing because they do things that are beyond and they have an understanding that is beyond. And when you teach them mantras, they can relate to it completely and totally because they're not relating to it with the human brain. It really might be difficult for us, but I want to just give you some quotes from Dajjum Rinpoche, who was a very famous master, and he said, externally, this age of conflicts, chaos erupts, that's for sure. Internally, exhaustion engulfs the body and mind. Secretly, vivid thoughts flood the conscious mind. He says the practitioner that transcends these three keeps a happy mind and is oh so joyful. I love that, that little poem that comes out of his book because I think we've forgotten how to be joyful. You know, it's so rare that I'm, I see people laughing only when they're drunk. I wonder why you have to get drunk when to be laughing. But People just don't laugh anymore to, like they used to. You don't hear all this hearty laugh. Read it again. Okay, Kathy. Externally, the, this age of conflicts, chaos erupts. Internally, exhaustion engulfs the body and mind. Secretly, vivid thoughts flood the conscious mind. The practitioner who transcends these three keeps a happy mind and is oh so joyful. That's for you, Kat. And the other quote that I want to give from him, which is really important, two more. He said, faithful disciple, any thought at all can arise. Yet, when thoughts of wrong views do, in other words, when you're thinking wrong views, angers and anxious and fears and all of that. He said, yet, when thoughts of wrong views do, meaning do arise, immediately recognize them. Know that you've said it, that wrong thing. Oh, I'm so anxious that, oh, I don't want to go to work. Oh, this person's upset me. Oh, this and that. He says, immediately recognize them. And then he says, if you sincerely acknowledge them, they will be purified. 
and this really comes from a master of note, they will be purified at all times, train in pure vision. That's what I'm trying to teach you, to go from that illusory impure vision to illusory pure vision to seeing things as they are, the three types of vision. He says, train in pure vision towards your Lama and your Vajra brothers and sisters. This is the profound vital point. Now, you know, some of his poetry is so simple. But what he says here is, you know how many times I think to myself in a day, oh, I'm so tired. Why am I saying, why am I thinking something like, I'm so tired, or oh, I can't stand doing this. I'm trying to get rid of stuff in our house at the moment so we can sell our house. So I find it very, very tiresome sorting out things and throwing things out. It's a very tiring job. Now, the wrong view is instead of going in and seeing it as a wonderful thing that I'm just, I should say, I'm getting rid of stuff and I'm getting rid of thoughts and I'm getting rid of possessions and I'm getting rid of everything. How marvelous. Be joyful about it instead of the wrong view. Now, when you see the wrong view, he says, acknowledge that and they will be purified. It's really important, very, very important that you do this. And then finally, he says, do not be weak. Do not be weak. Now, he's talking about when people and events interfere with your practice, etc. Quite a lot of people say to me now, sorry, Melanie, I can't come. I've got dinner. Sorry, Melanie, I can't come. I've had a really lousy day. And I'm going, of course, I really understand. We're humans in samsara. But maybe making the effort to go is going to change something really big in your life. And yesterday I was telling them in the group about the light Vajra body, our beautiful light body, our subtle body, which is what we left with when everything else dies. That's why Tim's father could actually speak because he was in his light body. The whole of the physical body had, had gone down. So here he says, do not be weak. And I'm saying when people and events, he was talking about interfere with your practice, you're, you're doing whatever you're doing spiritually. He says, don't be someone whose head bends whichever way the wind blows like blades of grass on a mountain pass. Okay, I think that's so true. Because you watch people, you know, when you're in a shrine room and people are and people are meditating or something like that, and say one of my animals runs in, you'll see the whole room will go like that to watch the animal. You know, we we can't just let a natural sound go without our minds going totally to distraction. So it's really important that we begin to understand that how we are going about life is oh, really, 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 they're barking at my husband who's late. They were on time and you were late. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when, when you, when you, whatever you're doing, something has gone drastically wrong with the way we are living. And we really need to correct it. It's so important that we really correct it. So on the basis of all that I've said, let's carry on. Because last week we were looking at relative truth, which is the way, the perception that we have with our human mind. Our human mind in Tibetan is called SEM, S-E-M-S, -E the samsaric dualistic mind you are there and I am here you know it's quite a funny thing I've got three people that I'm very close to that are going through immensely immensely hard difficult 
journeys at the moment. And I find when I think of them, I'm crying. I'm just crying for the pain that they're going through. But I'm saying to myself, your pain, and I actually write, your pain is my pain. Why do I think that if you're going through pain, mine, I haven't got pain? Of course I've got pain. There's no you and me. We're all one. We're all have Buddha nature, which means that whatever you're going through, I feel immense pain to you, especially if I'm close to you. So relative truth, we were talking last time, is that illusory, impure perception that we have. Whereas ultimate truth is the way things really are. The way things really are. And we're using in Tibetan, sem, which is the human mind, ni. Sem, N-Y-I, ni. Ni means Ni is a syllable that gets added onto, which means the emptiness of everything. So sem ni, there isn't really a tangible mind. And when you look at the first, the relative truth, we are going to go now tonight. It's completely and utterly dependent on causes and conditions. So the whole of our lives are like that. If we are hearing and loving, that's the kind of karma that will come back to us. If we are ugly and insulting, eventually the karma will come back. You look at someone like Putin, who just takes, he takes the whole of whoever gets in his way, and he just annihilates them. Now imagine that in terms of causes and conditions. Imagine how long. His life is going to actually be a life that is that is a life that is really, really suffering, a hell life. That's what he's going to have to pay afterwards because you can't just annihilate people because they have a different opinion to you. You can't do that. Just turn it a bit more. Okay, so the second part, the second part, sem ni, is totally divorced from causes and conditions. There are no causes and conditions. Your nature of mind, your Buddha nature, your awakened mind was always there. It never got born. It never arose. It never stayed like that. And it never died out. Your human mind dies out as we saw in the story. So what we are understanding is when I teach people about they're always fascinated with karmic causes and conditions. Everybody's got a million questions to ask and, and, and that kind of thing. But with, uh, with duality and with the wheel of life, which I want to just go through as well, it's like, oh, this I can really understand. The other, I can't, okay? But what I want you to do last time, I tried very hard to show you just a teeny drop of how things really work in your awakened mind. And now I'll go to the relative truth that people want the answer. I wonder where Tatiana is because she had all her questions about this. But you have to keep in mind while you are going through the karma, the alaya, the alaya consciousness, the ego. You have to keep in mind that that is just the temporary drama. It's really no thing. The real thing is who you really are. And if you keep that in mind all the time, it makes a huge difference to your life when you're going through terrible things. That's what I wanted to, you to understand. And when you're going through illness and anxiety and bereavement and all these kind of things, that's what you keep in mind and you say, hey, but there's this whole part of me that is not even vaguely affected by this. Let me find if I can go there more frequently and open it and open it. But you know what I've got to tell you all is that karma, people say, yeah, karma's cause and effect. 
You plant a you plant a seed and you get an apple tree. You plant an apple seed, you get an apple tree. Karma is the most complex, complex, complex thing. Okay, that's why you see so many people who are the most beautiful people going through the most horrific times. Okay, we can't tell because what happens with those people who come to a point where they just, where they've really, they've really put into practice negative emotions for such a long time and they come to a point where they are up to their eyeballs and over and they realize towards the end of their life what they've done, how they've wasted their time, how they've indulged in all these negative emotions and everything. And now they really want to change. Now those people, because they've indulged in that, when they die, they're not able to see that subtle life body because they're too involved in all their karma. But when they come to the third bardo, which is called the bardo of becoming, there they're able to see all their karmic patterns. And in their hearts, they make a tremendous like a tremendous, almost um, vow to themselves that they will not do this again, that they will bring through the opposite into their next life. And some people who are really aware do that. And so when they come into this life, they are the kindest, sweetest, or the most caring people, or the most whatever people, because they brought that vow to change whatever it was that they were doing. And then people see them going through really difficult times and they say, how can this be? Is there a God? Is there a universe? What are they doing? How come these people are going through such terrible times? But actually, there should be joy going through those challenges because those are the challenges for which you made the vow, which then clear everything, all the imprints, which then leave you free to get to your awakened mind. And if people could understand this, it would be so amazing if we could look at our difficult situations and say, oh, I'm in the right place at the right time in my home, how wonderful. Because there, this is just, the temporary drama giving you that opportunity, open portal to unity with your true nature. So it's really, really important. So you can only, only understand karma if you really have a light in mind. Because all the things that come together with the karma, we can never understand them. You can't even try to understand them in any way. But the Buddha could always see with his mind, with his awakened mind. So when he went and he saw the pirate on the ship taking everybody's jewelry and pointing a gun or whatever he was doing on the ship and everything, the Buddha could already see all his future lifetimes in the hell realm, suffering absolutely terribly. So he killed him. Now you say the Buddha killed somebody. He killed him to, with a completely compassionate motive to stop him from incurring further suffering. Now we could never do that because we don't have the whole picture. So karma is a very complex thing which we're going to deal with. But when you look at the four noble truths that the Buddha taught, it's so interesting because he taught them three times around the wheel. They called it the three wheels of turning. Now, most of you know them. If you knew, you won't know them. But you look at the four noble truths. Life as we know it is suffering. So if we keep going on with all this negativity, with all this hurting, with all this harming, with all this defending of our ego, we are creating suffering. That was the first noble truth. The second noble truth was 
There are causes for your suffering. Negative emotions and karma. That's what the Buddha taught. Causes and conditions. Negative emotions and karma have caused your suffering. Know that. The third noble truth. There is a place where there is the cessation of suffering. If you can take your mind, you might even be going through the Holocaust and you may be taking your mind into a very, very, very high place, okay, where you can see why, what everybody is going through and why they're going through the suffering they're going through. It's really important because he said there is a place where there is a cessation of suffering. And that's what I started with. There's a place where if you can tune into your nature of mind, you will not be suffering. It will stop because you'll realize this is just an experience of going through a temporary experience. And the fourth noble truth was, here is the path. Here are all the things I'm giving you in order to get you there. Okay, very, very, very interesting. Now, when the Buddha taught it the second time at a higher level, he taught the four causes, but he said, this is, this, the way you need in life is suffering. In the second time he taught it, he said, there is suffering and you must understand it. There are causes and you must understand them, etc. And then when he taught at the top of the tree, he said, life as you know it is suffering and you must understand it. But actually, there's nothing there. Here are the causes. Here is the karma. You must understand it. But actually, there's no thing there, nothing there, and so on. So what was he showing you? He was showing in his three ways that if you go to the nature of mind, this is no solid thing. It's all okay, even if you're going through a really hard time. You just look at illness. It's so fascinating. Someone today told me they had Parkinson's. So I went and I looked up Parkinson's, okay? And it says there, um, trying to control every event in your life. Just think about that. When you're controlling every event in your life, you are thinking like anything and you want everything to be in your control and you want everything to work out the way you want it and everything. Parkinson's, you shake. It's a manifestation from that. Don't look at me like that. You're skiffing me out of the moment. I'm just saying to you. Sorry, Mel. You, yes, Mel. Yes. I've just pulled out this book as you're talking. And okay. it's right here. It's Louise Hayes. Yeah. You can heal yeah. your body. Yeah. And it's exactly, she gives all the, uh, exactly. what's the, the emotions to it. And it's exactly, exactly. sorry. Yeah. And, you see, and illness is the last place where, it, where the karma manifests. But if you were sensitive and alert, do you know that you can have pre-ordained pre and dreams of the illness coming, you'll get, a, you'll get a clue. You say, you know, it's funny. My chest's a little tight or it's funny. I had a dream last night and it, my chest felt like it's closing. Now, if we would listen to that voice of truth, we would do something about it. You'd go, why is my throat, why is my chest closing up? You get a preordained thing about it in a dream or even as you're going along. You see it before it manifests in the body. It's like your true nature of mind's trying to give you a little push as to what you're getting. And if you listen to it, you could ask yourself, 
Why am I shaking? Why is my chest closing up? Maybe my chest is closing up because I just can't accept things that are happening to me now. Maybe my chest is closing up because I feel suffocated. I'm allowing myself to be suffocated in whatever's happening. You need to read it. It's deep. I'm going to tell you how the karmic imprints come in. But I wanted you to see that from the point of view of, um, before we go into the Alaya and the Alaya consciousness, and I'm sorry Tatiana isn't here because she wrote me all these questions. But I'm going to just read you this little story which tells you how it is. One day, a saint was taking a bath in a river. His disciples sat on the bank with the saint's clothes, with his asana and his rosary. The saint noticed a scorpion struggling in the current. Taking pity, he lifted the draggled scorpion in his palm and started wading toward the bank to take the scorpion out of the water. No sooner had the scorpion recovered than it promptly stung the saint on the palm. The saint felt an unbearable burning pain shoot up his arm, but he did not drop the scorpion. Instead, he gently shook his hand to encourage the scorpion to move away from the wound. The saint's disciple watching from the bank became alarmed, but he didn't say anything. The saint had only taken a few more steps when the scorpion stung him again, a searing pain more intense than the first one, went all the way up his arm and throbbed in his head. The saint staggered and nearly collapsed in the river. This time, the disciple did call out, Put him down, Luigi. He will only sting you again. Leave him to his fate. Your kindness is of no value to such a creature. He will learn nothing from it. The saint ignored him and continued walking. He had nearly reached the bank when the scorpion stung him for a third time. The pain exploded into his head, lungs, and, head, and heart. The disciples saw a blissful smile appear on the saint's face before he collapsed into the river. The disciple dragged the saint to the shore, still smiling and still craving the scorpion in his palm. As soon as they reached the shore, the scorpion crawled away as quickly as it could, as they do. Karuchi said the disciple after the saint had regained consciousness. How can you smile? That wretched creature nearly killed you. You are right, my son, said the saint. But he was only following his dharma, his nature. It is the dharma of a scorpion to sting. And it is the dharma of a saint to save its life. He is following his dharma and I am following mine. Everything is in its proper place. That is why I am so happy. Now that story is so different because I can tell you, when I came to my Indian retreat, and at first I saw this big, this big, um, what do you call, legume, leg, what they call, you know, those, those lizard things, but one about this side at the top, an iguana at the top of my cupboard. So the taxi comes in and I said, oh my God, look what's at the top of the cupboard there. He goes, ma'am, that is such good luck. <clears throat> I said, will he stay there? So he said, yes, he's got his place there. I thought, okay. So I'd had a Terrible day that day. I couldn't get the room and I couldn't get everything. And I come into the bathroom and there is a scorpion as big as this. So I just went to my bed and cried. There wasn't a soul to help me. Everyone was in silent retreat. I was all by myself and there was this big scorpion. So I stood at the bathroom door and I said to the scorpion, you Go under things. I know you always go under things. So you just find your place and don't let it be anywhere near me, okay? And I went off. I came back in the bathroom and he was gone. And I decided never to look for him again. But about a week or two later, he resurfaced. And then it was during the day. This was at night. So I took a broom and I swept him. 
out of the out of my room. I felt terrible doing it, which this saint wouldn't have done. But I swept him out of the room and then I swept him a little further along the corridor. And then I thought, but now he's gonna go into her room. I can't <laughs> so I swept him far away into the garden. <laughs> anyway, the long and the short of it is that later on in the retreat, there was another scorpion in the kitchen, okay? And I just, I just, I had my arrangements with scorpions and spiders because there was no one to help me. I just said, when spiders came and I was on the toilet, I'd say, now you, you go to your corner over there. I won't interfere with you. You don't interfere with me. And we can both live in harmony because you were here before me. So it's a kind of a different attitude, you know. It's kind of a different attitude because you think about it, you come into a retreat, that's the spider's corner. He's been living there probably for years. That's the iguana's top of the cupboard. He's been living there for years. The scorpion, who am I to kick them out when it's also their retreat center? A different story, Sean. You're smiling. <laughs> what are you thinking? Let me just throw it open for a minute. So I'm going to go on to the karmic tendencies and then we've got to do a, uh, a meditation. What are you thinking, Sean? Because you're laughing at me. Nothing. <laughs> Anyone want to ask or say anything? Poor Cutty walking along the station or wherever you are. Anyone want to say anything? So um, uh, oh, please. sorry. Okay, go on, Sean, first. And then oh, hi, Mal. Hi, everyone. How's it? Um, I just wanted to say that this whole animal thing in Buddhism, it, it's always at the back of my mind. I know I've brought it up in lots of your lectures, but now you, you're talking about creatures again. And for some reason, like my flat of late has been like, I've been getting birds and mice and rats. And like, I don't know if they're symbols and then I never want to hurt them. So I always like escort them out or ask them out nicely, but I also don't want them to be here. So your um what you were saying and stuff. And I don't know if you've heard the horrific story about the the boat that's in the harbor currently with all the cows. Oh, yeah, it's so terrible. And it's it just really makes me think like we really aren't treating animals properly. Like we really aren't. Like I don't think we're supposed to be eating them or, you know, like it, it just it feels cruel. It feels wrong. It, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't sit well with me. Like I wanted to know your thoughts on you know what I think animals and and no, all that I stuff think these very deep masters and these very high masters have got all their their things about it and many of them will not eat of the flesh but i've also seen and read some of these very high masters who do eat the flesh but what they do with that is they transform the animal when they're eating it so they're actually eating it much more for transforming the animal and giving them an amazing, an amazing start to be able to go off. I think, Sean, we do the best. I couldn't live with snakes and spiders in my bedroom and things like that. And I scream, you know, if my husband's there to come and take them. But the thing is that I think it's very important to understand that animals are our younger brothers. Okay, they in a realm that is below us because they don't have the ability to really to really intellectually think things out and negotiate the waters of samsara. So what is really, really important is, for example, if I, by mistake, I try, when I get into, when I get into the shower and there's an insect or two, I try and take them and put them out of the window, whatever the case is. But if by mistake I kill them, you know, if they get killed in the water, or whatever the case is, I always do a little prayer for them. I always go, Om Ahu, may you have a more lasting rebirth. You know, that kind of thing. So I think we can do that. The same with my two animals. I mean, they really regard the shrine room as theirs. And like I keep saying to them, remember this in your next life. Remember this in your next life because you really need to evolve this one, particularly back into human life. So it's got better opportunity to get enlightened. So we just try our best with them. That's mm. all. We but by Buddhist best. philosophy, like really animals are like our lower brothers. They've been um, born into yeah. a lower life 
and they're also trying to be awake, yeah. uh, reach uh, awake. Okay, yeah. So like, so eating them is not really good, and well, like, you know what? Yeah. I think it depends what you do, and I think certainly if sometimes you have to eat certain proteins or whatever the case is, I think it's very important that you um that you do the prayers and the blessings for the animal that you're eating, which would be helpful and useful for them, you know. Just depends on your health and what you need and everything. You know, I know that that's how the masters do it. If their health is bad, you know, then they will do the blessings. And so the animals have the benefit of those blessings. It's important. So, Danny, you wanted to say something? Um, Just with the Four Noble Truths. Yes. So you're saying that life, um, that the Buddha said life as we know it is suffering. Yes. Um, did he, is that sort of just, if you continue in your way, it's suffering? Or was he also saying the whole, like life as it is, like the different, like life and samsara is by definition suffering? Yeah. You see, it's the samsaric life because the spiritual life has not got suffering because it is used with sem ni, which doesn't have the imprints in it. Only when I come to the consciousness, maybe later tonight, I will show you how the Elia consciousness has the imprints, and that goes with you, okay? But the nature of mind has no such imprints, and that's why it's so important. That's why he was saying life as you know it is suffering. Because whatever you put in, you're going to get out. When we do the wheel of love, you see that there is a point. Whatever you do, you know, uh, let me give you this now because it's very interesting. I think this will help a lot. I was going to give it later, but it doesn't matter. Let me give it now. There's something that Tai C2 wrote about, and I think it's really very important. Um, let me just tell you what he said. He said, when we discuss karma, we have to realize that only on a relative level of samsara does good karma accumulate, you know, does good karma accumulate and lead to positive out, uh, outcomes and, and circumstances and negative karma leads to suffering and difficulty, okay? But he says no Buddhahood was ever achieved through good karma. Just listen carefully before you argue. He said the reason for this is that Buddhahood is beyond good karma. We all have that primordial purity and that is Buddha or awakened being. But it was always there. So a Buddha has realized it was there and we haven't. He says, sure, good karma might help to give us an opportunity to realize this. But for that matter, suffering might also give us an opportunity to realize this. That, you know, when people are suffering, they say there must be more. So he says, we are looking beyond samsara. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, yes, the life we lead, we negotiate life in samsara. But there are many people that actually decide not to not to live a life of, of completely indulging in samsara, okay? They choose to lead a life. Milarepa chose a life going into retreat for his whole life. So it's up to you. But what Tai Situ was saying is, yeah. Yeah, go on, go on. It's good, you guys. Go for it. Um, I, I had another question, you know, with the whole notion that like all life is suffering, like we are also supposed to experience joy. It's life is a gift at the end of the day. And we are supposed to experience joy, but just uh, maybe joy, pure joy. That's not um, affecting anyone in, in a negative way. Exactly. And exactly what you're saying is you right. are supposed to enjoy it as well. Like it's of course. not just, not just be you know, all suffering. That's very macabre. Like, no, so it's going to be, yeah. Macabre. I'm saying, yeah. but he said, life as you lead it inevitably has suffering, and the suffering is caused by negative emotions and karma. Okay, so a lot of people, it's really good. Of, when my husband and I have discussions, he goes like this He says, 
Look, Melanie, I think it's really important. I'm just quoting you. I think it's really important that people don't hurt other people and that they live a moral and valuable life. He said, I think that's fine for me. And I go, well, that's amazing. You're still going to be on that wheel of life when it goes around. You're going to have lots of good things from the people you've helped, from the people you've served, from what you've given. You're going to have lots of very, very positive things. That's your enjoyable life. But you're not going to get off the wheel of life. Now, the point is, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want that, that's absolutely fine. Okay. But while you are enjoying your life, you still lose the people you love. Often, you know, go through difficult times, go through illness, go through all these kind of things because we can't see all the karma we have accumulated. So yes, of course you must enjoy the life and you must be joyful and you must be happy, but you want to have something which is joyous a little more than impermanence. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to be happy on Thursday because a good thing happened to you and jolly unhappy on Friday because a bad thing happens to you. You want to get off the wheel of life. This is the temporary schoolroom. We need to graduate out of that. And that's what you're all learning now. That's what you're here for, to graduate out of it and to be able to tap into something which is really more ultimate and more, more, um, it'll continue like that, you know, rather than it's going to turn tomorrow kind of thing. Do you want so to? Mel, could, I, could I just ask a question with the oh, karma? Please. If you've got somebody, your partner, who is going through stuff, which is his karma, yes. it still affects my, me and my karma. Oh. So, that's the, the circle, yeah. That's, yeah. which I find difficult to sort of yeah, because, understand. Yeah, but the basic thing is, look how many parents go through terrible difficulties with their kids, you know, and can see sometimes that their kids are really, are really giving them a hard time, or they're giving the kids a hard time, or their kids are giving them a lot of grief and suffering and things like that. And you know what? It, you see, those people are the people, that's why I said karma can't just be understood with the ordinary mind. Karma has to be understood with your nature of mind because then you can see all the ins and outs. Now, when you look at somebody who is doing quite well and on a spiritual path and they have a partner who's really not doing well and suffering very badly and not making it and not doing this. And you think to yourself, I wonder why I have to go through this. You see, we can't judge because we all touch each other's lives. As in Buddhism, it says, everyone's been your mother, everyone's been your brother, everyone's been. We don't know if that person that we are closely connected to wasn't our mother in a previous lifetime and gave up absolutely everything so that we could go this way and come to this point. And now it's the chance to give back. So if you are, if you are extremely compassionate to that, and if you are really loving and kind and try to help them, but also to put a limitation, because sometimes you look at a person and you can see they're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And you love them very dearly, but they're not going to listen to wake up and do it differently. Do you know what I mean? Then it's very painful. And sometimes you have to say to that person, you try and be kind and compassionate and everything. But when they fall into the pit, you're not running there to pull them out of the pit because you think, you know what? They're going to have to struggle this out on their own because they won't listen to anything that you're trying to give them when you are trying to show them a different route and a different journey. But it is the karmic connection which puts us in touch 
with absolutely all the people that are that are in our lives. And that's really not easy. Many times it's not easy. Many times the people that are in lives are very, very difficult. And I find it difficult because sometimes I can see with my children, you know, how they see things, but they're never going to listen to what I've got to say. They really are not going to listen to what I've got to say. Well, that's the way it is. I have to watch this and I have to be, be patient and tolerant about it. You know what I'm trying to say? So it's a really, really important thing. You know, I was going to do another area, but I want to just say this and then let's do a let's do a meditation. But remember last time I said there is the essence, which is emptiness, which is full of potential, which is absolutely pure. And out of the emptiness comes the luminosity, the luminous phenomena. And they will eventually go back into the emptiness. And when you understand that everything you are seeing, even the angry person, the killing person, the lousy thing, is really, if you really looked at it through pure eyes, you'd see the beauty in it. You'd see the purity in it. It's just that we can only tune in on that level. But it's very important to understand that that pure nature is never tainted by any of the karmic condition. So I just want to read you this and then we'll do this. When we are caught, when we are caught in the dualistic, impure, karmic perception, all our energies are experienced as substantial. So we think this anger is substantial. We think this fear is substantial. We think this happiness is substantial. We make such such a, a, a complete error with this because this way of looking at things moves us towards the bondage of the karmic tendencies, the bondage. That's what tonight is about, the bondage. So what people say to me many, many times is, you know, Melanie, I'm a person who really gets depressed very often. I'm a depressed person. I'm a very anxious person. People will say that to you. I'm a very anxious person. I'm a very dependent person. I depend on others. Now, what I try and get people to train in is instead of saying that, which is only your temporary personality, your temporary identity, rather say, up to now, I've been in the habit of being dependent on people, but now I'm going to try this. Up to now, I've been in the habit of being anxious. I used to be anxious, but now I'm trying to change it. Loosen, loosen that identity, that label that we give each other and move out of the bondage of temporary karmic tendencies. Now, it's very, oh, please. Well, okay, that's fine. I'm just going to finish this and then you can talk. Namka Norbu is a very... He's a very high master. He says, all paths in Buddhism have the common aim, except right at the top, of seeking to overcome the problem that arose when the individual entered duality. Remember we were talking about Adam and Eve taking themselves out of the beautiful, pure land of the Garden of Eden and then saying, God sent me. God's punishing me. Instead of saying, we got an ego and then we removed ourselves from the pure land and now we banished from our true state and we don't know what to do with ourselves. That's what happened. That's what the story was all about. And he says here, yeah, when the individual entered duality, dualism, he developed a spurious subjective self or ego. Suddenly, there was I, 
There was a subjective self that experiences the whole world separate from itself, separate from itself, external and objective, and which continually tries to manipulate that world in order to obtain satisfaction and security. Because think about it. The minute we couldn't be one, the minute we took ourselves out of the pure land into duality, we were unsafe. We were insecure. We were dissatisfied. So now think about what we're doing in this life. In truth, we will never manage. Now listen carefully to obtain satisfaction and um and security this way because what is the cause of suffering and dissatisfaction? The fundamental issue, the sense of not being complete, of incompleteness. So because I've separated myself, now I'm alone. Me and mine are alone. I've got to defend me and mine all the time. So I'm insecure. I'm trying to find a way. I'm insecure. And so when we try to make security and satisfaction through money, through relationships, through changing, through holidays, through everything, it's always temporary. It never lasts because there is this sense of incompleteness somewhere. I took myself away from my true nature. So I always feel there's something missing. People come to me very often and they say, Melanie, I've tried everything in my life. I had a guy come to see me, very interesting. When he told me all the courses he'd done and all the therapists he'd been to and all the different things he'd been to, I was already tired just listening to where he'd been, okay? I couldn't believe it. I said, none of them gave you what you want? No. And then he said, a friend of mine said, you'll sort me out. Okay, very difficult. I said, but how do I not go on your long list of bad therapists? That's my main thing. How do I avoid not going on your bad list of therapists? I said, you know what? You've got to change things very, very drastically. Because otherwise, and I told him, he was like a hungry ghost. I said, you never get satisfied. The hungry ghost, no matter what you put into them, no matter how much money they get, if they get millions, they want many, many more millions. They're never satisfied because there's a sense of incompleteness. You've left behind that absolute beautiful thing and all the seemingly external phenomena on which we try to base our satisfaction and security are impermanent. Very interesting, don't you think? So Very now, yes. If, if the, um, so here we go. We are, we are we going. We living these lives in samsara. We're forgetting our true nature, and then we get these reminders like, um, you know, things happen in life, uh, illness, yeah. Sickness, yeah. So for me, uh, the wake up call was cancer. But then I was lucky because then, um. I, I recognized or I had this reminder that like, oh, I've actually learned all this stuff. And then um, I uh, had with that mind, I then approached the illness. And now as I live my life now, um, I forget. And then I remember. And then uh, and now I'm living this like uh, unapologetically positive life. Um bringing it into the world, who I am, I am who I am, I'm a positive person, I'm a strong person, 
I, um, you know, connect to the teachings and I live the teachings and, um, but life is still happening. Like I still get irritated, but that's fine because yeah. I'm human. I'm living a human experience. There's parts of me that are enlightened, but I'm still human. That you know, and it's okay, and I can laugh at it. But I want to go back to when you got diagnosed again, yeah. because yeah. because I want to go back so they can all learn from it. Okay, yeah. Because Baby got diagnosed with a real stage four something cancer and everything. I just remember the call from you and the text. Yes. From you. Yes, you said, yes. Melanie, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? I remember very clearly. And I yes. said, you're going to do this with all your wisdom and knowledge and experience spiritually that you've gained. You choose to do chemo, that's your problem, your decision. But for me, the minute you are diagnosed with a really bad illness, you have to look at the mirror. What does, what is this mirror showing me? Yeah. What is it showing me? What do I have to learn? What do I have to change? And you and I both knew the things you had to change. Okay, you were careless and you you were you didn't do your practice devotedly or anything like that. And it gave you a wake up call to love. Yes. Well, I was it, becoming negative. So I was um I yeah. wasn't bringing that joy into the world, you know. I was becoming a bit negative and upset and angry about stupid things and uh now I'm just a lot I'm just happy. No, you're much happier and everything. And, I and it's it, so lovely to see Patricia. I just have to say hello. Yeah, no, she looks gorgeous like that. But I'm going to read you this story because I think it's really relevant. And then we'll do a meditation. I think this is a beautiful story. Listen, I remember a middle-aged American woman who came to see Dajum Rinpoche, the same guy that I gave you the quotes, in New York in 1976. She had no particular interest in Buddhism, but she had heard that there was a great master in town. She was extremely sick, and in her desperation, she was willing to try anything, even see a Tibetan master. At that time, I was his translator. She came into the room and sat in front of Dajim Rinpoche. She was so moved by her own condition and his presence that she broke down into tears. She blurted out, my doctor has given me only a few months to live. Can you help me? I am dying. To her surprise, in a gentle yet compassionate way, Dajam Rinpoche began to chuckle. Then he said quietly, you see, we are all dying. It's just a matter of time. Some of us, just die sooner than others. He said, with these few words, he helped her to see the universality of death and that her impending death was not unique. This eased her anxiety. Then he talked about dying and acceptance of death. And he spoke about the hope that there is in death. At the end, he gave her a healing practice which she followed enthusiastically. Not only did she come to accept death, but by following the practice with complete dedication, she was totally healed. I have heard of many other people, <clears throat> cases of people who were diagnosed as terminally ill and given only a few months to live. When they went into solitude, followed a spiritual practice and truly faced themselves and the fact of death, they were healed. What is this telling us? That when we accept death, transform our attitude to life, and discover the fundamental connection between life and death, a dramatic possibility for healing can occur. Tibetan Buddhists believe that illnesses like cancer can be a warning to remind us that we have been neglecting deep aspects of our being, such as our spiritual needs, if we take this warning seriously and change fundamentally the direction of our lives, 
there is a very real hope for healing not only our bodies, but our whole being. Beautiful story. Love it, love it, love it. So <laughs> true. Very, very true. Makes me so happy. Yeah, love it. Let's do the meditation and then let's just look at the Alaya consciousness before we, we do it. But I really want you to try and just take a chill pill and let yourselves just float into the space of who you are. Just let everything be. The other night, Sean was texting me and saying he felt anxious about a big thing he had to do the next day and everything. So instead of answering him, I just did a meditation with him on the audio. And I think we must do that meditation, Sean, because it is not to be hooked into the tangibility of what we are facing in our lives. Everything is just a temporary, transient experience that we need in order to get where we're going. That's all, nothing more, nothing less. So it's very, very, very strong. Who's, who's on Samsung? I don't know who that is. Let me see what you see. Um, a pure view correlates to what I think you said before. I'll read that off to him. The healing power of illness. I know that one. That's by Death Lefson or something. I, rem I remember reading and studying that book. It's a very, very, very nice book. But that's not our subject today. Let's just do a little meditation. Always have your spinal column straight, even if you're doing walking meditation simply to bring all the energy into the central channel. The prana that moves in the central channel is non-duality. It just is. So when you can completely relax your bodies, your hands right over left with the thumbs touching, your shoulders back, your chin tucked in a little bit, your spinal column straight, and you're breathing in to the count of three or four, out to the count of three or four, in and out. Check the body, all the parts of the body. Check your forehead and see where there is tension. Check your hands to see if they're totally relaxed. Your arms, your legs, just let that beautiful, beautiful light flow through your body. Just a few minutes to check in. And this is what you should do every day in the middle of your work. Just have a check-in for half a minute wherever you are. Sit, have your spinal column straight and do your breathing. And just let everything be for that moment. Whatever tensions are in the office, whatever people are doing or not doing to you, whatever deal you didn't get, whatever job you didn't manage, whatever project didn't work, whatever your relationships are doing, just let it be. Do not go back to pick it up again. Dissect it. Judge it. Analyze it. Just let it be. As you breathe in and out, I want you to see the spaciousness of the sky all around you. Enough space to fit everything in. And you're just breathing in and out and allowing absolutely everything to just arise. No panic, no anxiety, no tension, no analysis, 
just letting it all be and bringing the mind back to the breath and feeling that beautiful, beautiful peace within the whole body. It's not that meditation is to get peace. It's just that the meditation is to remind you of that beautiful, spacious nature of mind that is never affected by any causes and conditions. And if at least 10 times in the day, even for 10 seconds, you just remind yourself about it. One day, you'll just be sitting in a clear light for a half a second, and you'll come back, and you'll know that it is there. One day, you will wake up in the morning, and hear the voice giving you everything you need for that day. But so many times we get woken up our own alarm and we've got so many tense things to do. We don't stop when we wake up. Sit up in bed. Breathe in. Breathe out all the tension. And recall where you've been in your sleep state, before you go into the world, before you go into your life. Bring it all back, because that is where you have the beautiful contact with your nature of mind. And when you go to sleep at night, even for one minute in the bed, sit in your meditative posture, do your breathing in, and out and just let go of all the events of the day so that you have a clear mind and when you go to sleep and you put your head on the pillow visualize this beautiful ah in your heart going out with rainbow light surrounding your whole body as you fall asleep hearing everything so that you go to sleep with that clear light mind and you wake up with that clear light mind. So you are tuning in little by little, step by step to the whole awakened side of your being. So before you go, just let's finish this bit on the karma because I think it's really, I think it's really important to actually just finish this and then I'll I'll open it for questions. But what's really, really important is like this. Every time we have what is called the alaya. I want you to understand that the alaya is separate from the alaya consciousness. So just as you've got eyes and your eyes see things, but they can't register what they are seeing unless there was an eye consciousness behind the eye. So the eye can only see when the eye consciousness is behind it. So when you die, and your eyes are wide open, you can't see anything because the consciousness has now left the body. So we have something in our, in our beings, in our psyche called the alaya. The alaya is like, it's like a spacious blank space. You know, I think the way you can understand alaya, another word for alaya, and these were Tatiana's question is the substrate. You can call it the alaya or the substrate. It's almost like the cement, you know, cement when it's wet, and then you stand in it and it makes an imprint in it. 
So we've got this alaya, and then we've got this alaya consciousness, which is the eighth consciousness that we have. And that alaya consciousness, it can also be called alaya vijnana or alaya storehouse consciousness. That's where all our karmic imprints are. So every time you think, every time, every time you think, every time you act, every time you feel, depending, I mean, if you just have a little sudden glance feeling, it's not going to make an imprint. But if you've got habits, like you're always anxious about things, whatever you do, feel and act, makes a deep imprint, like in the cement, I'm saying, of the Alaya consciousness. <laughs> and out of all the levels of consciousness, that's the only one that goes with you. So if you keep on doing the same thing, and often I'm texting people and I'm going, why aren't you changing this? Because if you keep on doing the same thing, it makes a deep, a deep calming in, calming imprint in the Alaya consciousness that has to go with you. Now, you can read your imprints very, very clearly because if you look, the habitual imprints are the same repetitive habits that people have. Now, when I've got someone sitting before me, I'm immediately looking at their repetitive imprints so let's say you had a really a, a really authoritarian abusive father, okay? And then from the authoritarian or abusive father, you have a very authoritarian abusive teacher. And then you go to university and your lecturer is quite abusive. And then you marry and your 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 partner's very very authoritarian and abusive or very dominating of you, then you can check those are my those are my repetitive karmic imprints. That's what I've really got to resolve. So when one of those people come into your life, you're looking clearly at the mirror of what that repetitive habit really is. And you're actually quite glad that this person is here because this person is here because you created that person with your imprint. So your imprint creates the scenario that is in front of you. And you should be clapping and be very happy it's there because it gives you a chance not to react. Let's say, let's say you had this dominating father and you were always scared and you always thought you were going to get a clap or something like that. Now you've got this dominating person, you're going to react completely differently to them. You're going to stand up and you're going to look at what you are being taught. Maybe, maybe one of your karmic imprints was that you were never able to talk up for yourself. And now in this lifetime, you really, really, really have to eradicate that imprint so it does not go with you into the into the next slide. Now, in our true nature of mind, there are none of these traces. Enlightened, you know, the masters say, enlightened beings' thoughts are like drawings in the air. Now, watch me. I'm drawing a person in the air. Can you see it? No, it's gone. I drew it and it's gone. Drawings in the air are what your thoughts are really about. It's just they're there and then they're gone. Those beings don't cling in any way. There's no dualistic perception. There's no karmic accumulation. Why? Because everything that arises, they know comes out of the essence and they just allow it to liberate itself. As soon as you go back, pick it up, dissect it, look at it, analyze it, cling to it, Lament about it, you're in it. It'll not liberate itself, but if you let it be and you let it go and you don't go back. And I watch people, I laugh because they tell me, 
This is the end of this, Melanie, I'm telling you. And then I get another text from him. You know what happened? And the same old stuff comes up again because they picked it up again. Okay. And I'm the observer watching how they pick it up, analyze it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. The more you repeat it, the deeper the imprint. So what we'll do next time is we'll go through the, the levels of consciousness, how they work on the wheel of life and how we can really move into primordial consciousness rather than ordinary consciousness. It's really very, very important. And I think what I'm going to do is, I think that I'm going to end, I've given you a lot of input. You can hear my voice is like very squeaky at the moment because I've been doing a lot of talking today, but I really want you to think about this and I will definitely answer any of your questions. And if you want to think about them and text them to me, that's also fun. I answer them very quickly. I just send an audio. But I want you, let's have one, que one question if anybody wants or one comment and then we're going to dedicate and I'll wait for people if they want to ask anything. Anyone want to say anything? There's a lot that you have to think about, even if you've been on the path for a long time. Right, Mart? Do you agree with that, Martin? I mean, these are the things we have to keep going back to all the time because it's essential that we complete this. Anyone want to ask? Okay, well, then we're going to dedicate and then I'll, if you want to ask me still, Without the recording, you're welcome. Okay. Um, let's dedicate to all beings that are trapped. All beings that are trapped in their momentums of ugliness, hurting, annihilating, really trapped and find them can't do anything except to follow those karmic imprints that stir them all the time. And through this merit of this teaching that we've done tonight, may we all achieve all-seeing Buddhahood and thereafter, once all harmful enemies have been defeated, remembering that they aren't really tangible enemies, they're just our own creations, may all beings be liberated from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, remembering that many, many people who have attained enlightenment don't any longer go through birth, old age, sickness, or death, but they often come back to teach us through their birth, old age, sickness, and death, but they're not bound by the laws of karma in any way. Sonam die tamche zipane topne nepe dranam tamche ne chega na chi bala topaye sipe sole do a do war show. So let's stop that recording.